Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this episode of the Truffle Tales podcast, where it's my job to chat with truffle hunters, mushroom experts, and enthusiasts from around the world and tease out their stories of inspiration and wisdom with you, helping you to deepen your connection with Mother Nature and learn more about the wonderful world of truffles and fungi. And our guest today is Melissa Waddingham. Since 2011, Melissa has been a professional truffle hunter in the UK. Together with her dog, she respectfully and sustainably hunts for truffle mushrooms. She's a student of forestry and woodland management, which has, along with her quest for truffles, developed a profound respect for the associations between truffles, mushrooms and the woodlands they can be found in. Ten years ago, she later turned this passion into a career, launching her mushroom foraging business, Truffle and Mushroom Hunter. For anyone interested in truffles, Melissa does it all, from leading truffle foraging courses, training truffle dogs, carrying out woodland surveys, and collaborating with landowners to nurture environments for truffle cultivation. She's a member of the British Mycology Society and sat on the board for the Professional Foragers Association for several years. You can find more about her by visiting her website over at truffleandmushroomhunter.com, Instagram and Facebook at truffleandmushroomhunter. Melissa. Welcome to the show. Hi, Ben. Thank you very much for having me. It's really, really, uh, really good to have you on. Um, I know we touched base uh, over a year ago when we first connected, and uh, and this is something I've been procrastinating on getting this podcast going. And it's just great to have you as one of the uh, the early people to to help support the channel. So yeah, really excited to talk more with you. And with that, could you could you just start off by just sharing your basically how you got into foraging uh, what was the transition uh, where did it start uh, and and leading up to the point of when you you know you found your first truffles wow that's quite a long journey to the talk big about one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um although i was brought up in london as a youngster from birth um i was always uh privileged to be taken to the countryside on weekends or half terms or during the holiday periods I had grandparents outside of London and various places that my parents would take me um, which were always in the countryside because I think my parents also um, had a great respect and love for the countryside not just living in London so I was very lucky to have that Um, and uh, from as early as I can remember I can always just remember bringing bits and pieces home, whether it was flowers or a pretty stick or stone or um, picking edible bits and pieces with my parents, like, you know, cob nuts or black braise or uh, chanterelle with my grandfather once uh, on a holiday in France. So there was always a little bit of that instilled in my youth. And, and I had a natural um, affinity with nature and loved birds actually when uh, I, one of my first passions was watching birds um, quite obsessively I'd know them all from the beginning of the book to the end by by the age I was sort of 10 or 11. What do you and, think it was about the birds that you, you love so much? Um, their colours, their song, uh, the fact that they flew, I mean this is from a real childhood perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, It was something also growing up in a city that you had access to, to a small degree. Um, You know, you'd see blue tits in the gardens and blackbirds and sparrows and pigeons. And I remember actually recently finding a little project that I'd written. I don't know how old I was, maybe eight or something on Mm. on London, on London pigeons. Um, (laughs) So I've always had a a, a love for nature and and animals. And actually, um, at the age of 12, I wanted to be a zoologist. And uh, I was terribly uh, uh, misguided by my headmistress who told me at that age that you couldn't possibly do zoology because you're useless at maths and your English isn't very good. And um, I then think my education uh, uh, went from having some hope to just having my head on the desk in my arms and I completely gave up through secondary education because I was very dyslexic (laughs) and it was at a time that dyslexia wasn't recognized so Mm. um, sadly I then pursued my um, career much later on with a a very distorted view of what I was able to achieve and what I wasn't and um, didn't venture into the world of animals or botany or fungi or anything like that until much much later on which is actually really sad I, I think was, hmm. was was 
yeah, I missed out on quite a lot and wished I'd sort of ventured into that a lot younger, but life is what it is and it takes you in the directions that it takes you in. But having always had that love for nature, it, it was always within me, even though a lot of my years were in cities and uh, it wasn't until I was um, in my early, uh, sort of early 40s, middle, mid 30s, early 40s, that I was back in, in the countryside um, with my children, um, bringing them up outside of London. And um, when you're in nature, you can't help but observe it and see it. And it was suddenly back in my life as quick as it had, you know, seemed to have gone. Because um, it was quite a long time where it didn't really feature, you know, so much. And um, and that was really nice. And it, it just opened doors to seeing new things, meeting new people. And it, the mushroom um, adventure really, really started with a friend coming in with a huge bar basket of porcini. And I hadn't even really thought about mushrooms since being a very early kid with my grandfather picking those chanterelles. I hadn't really mm. entered into my mind again for some reason. I hadn't even thought fungi. Um, and I was just completely smitten. I just remember that feeling that when I saw him walk through the door with this basket of beautiful sets, huge. And I was like, my goodness me, they're almost architect arch architectural, those mushrooms. They're just stunning. They're beautiful. Where did you get those? He was like, oh, just down the road. And I was like, really? Why have I not seen mushrooms on, on my sort of walks? And it's not something that's really featured in my mind. How bizarre. How could we not see these wonderful creatures, you know, every time you go out? And um, so really from there it just I was totally smitten and, and and I just insisted that I he took me with him and he was adorable took me with him on nearly every hunt and and we got so engrossed both of us in it um in the subject of he was Italian so he was predominantly into edible fungi which is with a French mother me um mm. was also um through my stomach as well you know obviously to start with obviously that was the main sort of attraction um I love food. I love good food. I've been brought up with good food very, very luckily. Um, so it sort of started like that. And we'd go and look for all good, you know, gastro edibles. And um, and I, my path sort of just continued growing. And, and it wasn't all of a sudden just about edibles anymore. It was about all mushrooms. And I just got, I just got the bug badly. And every mushroom I saw, I wanted to try and identify it and understand what relationship it had with the environment with the trees with the plants and 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 just get you know get the bigger picture and um so uh i was now by sort of in early 40s children nearly grown up a failed academic <laughs> and i felt that i need the, uh, to prove to myself that you know i could actually do something that i was passionate about and maybe take this this um hobby a bit further and you know immerse myself in more of the science of of everything and um i would have loved to have gone and done a mycology course but hmm. the nearest place to me wasn't really i think it was reading or i think reading university it just wasn't with my children still around it wasn't really conducive for me to go there so i sort of thought well what's the next best thing um and I was very lucky to live not very far from Plumpton College. And it was the first prospectus that I've ever looked at in my life, which actually gave me pleasure. Mm. Um, and I was like, wow, God, there are, there are universities and colleges that, of course there are. But, you know, you sometimes you're so narrow minded, especially when you come from a city that, you know, of course, there's agricultural colleges. <laughs> of course, there's everything to do with the countryside that you can learn, countryside management, forestry, you know um land husbandry all all these wonderful things cattle you know um farming and i was like wow okay now this is a bit more interesting and on the forestry prospectus all the modules were very much in keeping with subjects that i needed to know as a uh, a fungi uh, enthusiast soil tree species habitat uh companion plants you know all these things and it was just it was just amazing so I went and did the course, obviously, um, and very happy that I managed to see it through because it was quite often that I would start something and give up in my younger years. Um, but I saw it through. I passed. Uh, I did OK. I didn't accept the help from the dyslexic team because I just wanted to do it with my raw capability just to see where I stood. Um, 
and you know, I mean, it wasn't a hundred percent pass, but I, I, I got through okay and armed myself with all the bits out of that course that I felt were really important to me. Mm. And I would do my own. I was very motivated, you know, and still am. And and you know, we'd do a lot of my own re- private research in the field of truffles, particularly, and, and mushrooms. Um, which eventually led me to sort of, you know, having the knowledge that I have today. Um, it's, you're always learning. Um, so, so yes, and the journey with the dogs and, you know, training the dogs to become travel hunters. And, so that's how it all started, really. Did you have dogs before you sort of had this idea to go and use them to hunt truffles? No, as a child, I was always never allowed pets, which always broke my heart because I always wanted a dog or a cat or something, but yeah. I was really strict. They wouldn't let me have anything. So I remember as soon as I left home, one of the first things I did was went and got a dog okay. and, and had two or three, you know, before I had my first truffle hound. So I, I understood dogs, how they tick, what they like, mm. you know, how they respond to basic training, although my dogs are fairly sort of free-spirited and wild and probably not the best <laughs> trained dogs in the world but um you know they love they love hunting truffle and very mm. good at it and um so yes I, I knew how they ticked and actually I just lost the family pet when I started this journey and and uh, I didn't really want to replace her because she was a really fabulous family dog and it, it really upset me that I'd lost her and the thought of getting another dog um with that huge emotional tie and uh, it's just uh, when you lose them it's just so hard and they don't have very long lives and you just get so attached to something for such a short amount of time it's quite I find it quite difficult Mm -hmm. but as you know I since then you know um well had three up until recently I've just lost Zeb unfortunately so I've just gone through that whole heart wrench just recently which is still still quite fresh it was only you know, a couple of months ago oh. um so i've got the two girls left and, and actually sadly uh, ella you probably can't see but behind me what? she's got a big big cone on her head what were um, their names again this little one with the cone on her head is ella she's the she's the dog that i got after zebedee yeah Ella. Who is my yellow lab, my master, my master, my master truffle hound. Um, and then I got Ella, um, who's actually a lot older than I, I don't know, who seems to have lost a couple of years, haven't we? Um, but she's 10 and she's just had a huge operation for breast cancer. And oh. so I'm a bit mortified. That, oh, no, come on. I've just lost Zeb. Stop it. And um, Esty. So I've got two lovely Esty. talkers still. And Esty's short for tuba estivum. Oh, oh. <laughs> nice. Esty um and um i'm hoping desperately that next year that we can come home and do what we love really again start it all up and running again and so what led to you finding your first truffle and what was that like (laughs) oh i don't think you're ever going to forget finding your first truffle it's one of those real hallelujah moments um before getting zeb I, I, because, like I said, I didn't want to um, get a dog, really. So I was at the stage where, you know, I just read in old Roger's book that you could find truffles on the South Coast. And so I was like, really? <laughs> um, and uh, had read in other articles and various bits and pieces that they're so incredibly hard to find. And people had spent all their lives looking for truffles without a dog. And it's virtually impossible. And, you know, all this, which is so actually hyped up to make it sound so elusive that I don't think it really warranted quite, you know, those statements in the articles that I read. Um, Yes, of course, it's difficult to find them, even with dogs sometimes, but, you know, it's not impossible, as I clearly proved the day that I went out on my first attempt. Um, I'd done a lot of research about uh, Tuba Estevam in particular, um, being close to where I lived, um what areas of habitat they liked and after doing you know getting the map out and choosing what I thought was probably the best wood to try for the first time um off I went and you know without a dog without a trowel even I just had a garden glove on my hand (laughs) I'd read that they come up I didn't want to go and do anything invasive you know I, I just wanted to go and just gently look through the leaf litter and see what we could find like that 
because I'd read that they came very close to the surface and that if you were in the right areas, you could almost see them sticking through the ground. And mm. So I it wasn't really envisaging on like digging or anything too intrusively or anything. So we sat up, we, we set off and, and, and Ian, the chap who had came in with a bag of porcini, obviously had to be on the first truffle hunt. Yeah. Um, and um, we curiously met up um, at a car park where he was already, he was already apple picking. It was really bizarre. Um, Cause I told, I told him, you know, we, we could meet anywhere between such and such X and X and Y, you know, and it was a huge long road and it, it, it just happened to be in the same spot. It was really bizarre. It was like a gnomon. Um, my whole beginning as of this truffle journey were really quite peculiar, uh, almost like a spiritual guiding. Um, a real journey and one that I haven't quite repeated since it's, it's it was really bizarre lots of signs lots of strange coincidences incredible luck um, and if you were just open to listening to what you know it seemed the world was telling me at that time it was just like the doors were being flung open for me every time I took a step forward it was just yep another open door yep that's easy you can fly over that hurdle and I, I put hurdles in front of me to purposefully make my journey a bit hard because I didn't want the dog. So I was like, well, I'm not going to get the dog unless I find truffles. Well, mm. first time out, found truffles. Um, so I was like, oh, okay, I made myself a promise I'd get a dog. Okay, okay. And it was just a bit like that the whole way through. So, so can I ask you, what, what, are the, what are the handful of things that someone would need to know uh, or to do in order to find a truffle maybe without a dog? Um, well, I would first say to them, whatever you do, please just don't go and, you know, go out to the woods with a trowel and just start digging up in areas where you think they're going to be, because that's just totally unacceptable. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, if you're very careful and cautious, then there are ways that I, I teach people to look for truffle, but you're basically looking um, for your animal competition and you're following your animal competition. And it becomes very, very clear through... Um, uh you know it's being it's a bit like being a tracker so you're so you're looking at the animal activity while they've been hunting truffle and you're just following them up and quite often they leave behind stuff or unearth stuff and don't mm. eat it or eat it but leave signs of eating it um so you know i mean i would say if you're going to look for truffle without a dog you've basically got to look for the diggings of the other animals that's been eating truffle and every little hole that you see in woodland that you might think is truffle woodland, um, you've got to just get on your hands and knees and smell all the smelly holes. <laughs> <laughs> and if they smell of truffle, if you're in a woodland that's truffle and you see diggings like that, if you smell the holes, uh, probably two times out of 20, you might come up with truffle. I mean, if you're in a really good woodland that's very productive, you know, it can be a really good way. Um, and truffle in the ground is you know it smells really sweet and and really strong and it if you you know i often with clients will will get them to smell a hole where truffle we've just taken it out or where one has been recently and we've seen where the animals been digging or left half a truffle out visible for us to see um and i'll get them to smell the ground and it smells like beetroot almost and then i'll make a little scraping you know a couple of feet away in hope that there's not a truffle there too just for them to smell the soil that smells just without truffle you know mm. um because they smell very different really really different one's sweet beetroot and one's just soil musky earthy foresty as you know soil smells um so if you were to just do that you may be lucky and come across um you know a previous digging by an animal which has done most of the work for you and, and, and if it smells sweet, so I would start then looking to see in the hole whether they perhaps left it behind because they've been frightened. So they've started to dig, dog walk has passed, it's scurried off, it's left the truffle, but it's made a visual clue that there could be one there or there is one there. So I'd go and smell it. And if it smells slightly beetrooty, I would start digging a little bit more. And if the smell dissipates it's a clue or a sign that in fact the truffle's gone 
and that you've just disturbed the initial smelly soil that was almost because when they take the truffle it's almost when, when you look at the hole it's just like an imprint they're very tidy about how they remove the truffle from they they, they, don't, they don't cause any outside damage you know now, are we talking deer here or literally birds this is more or? rodents yeah this right, is more like rodents i mean things like that Yes, and, and dormice and, you know, things like that. I mean, uh, badgers uh, are, are not quite as neat in their way for looking yeah. for truffle, nor a wild boar. But I'm just, you know, but more, more the rodents, um, really, I'm talking about in this particular instance. I mean, I, mean, I can, you know, f- uh, follow the tracks of, of wild boar and, and, and badger as well to find areas where, you know, they've really zeroed in on an area. It's just very different uh, tracks and and you know visual clues but just going back to where the rodents just take out the truffle i mean they've just done a little dig and there's a little pile of soil behind the hole you know where it's just gone between their back legs and the accumulators mm. and um and then they get to the truffle and literally they just take it out so when when you when you see the diggings for truffle it's just a little pile of soil and almost a circular imprint where the truffles come out. It's like almost a cast, you know, and you're like, wow, okay. So anything that looks like that, I'll smell. And if the truffle's gone, yes, the, small, the, the soil, if it's a fairly fresh digging, will we'll still have the connotations of that beetroot. But then once you start looking for the truffle that's already been taken further down, then that goes very, very quickly. But if you start digging and the truffle's still there, then actually the more you dig the, the the truffle smell increases as opposed to decreases so you're like well, oh okay i've disturbed some soil that smell's getting stronger well it's a clear indication that the truffle's still there so um that would be the only way that i would really you know suggest to people that if they really really wanted to look for truffle without a dog it's the only way that you would maybe have a chance without being invasive or destructive we, you know, we always have to remember that the mycelium, the organism, is always attached to the fine roots of the trees. And they're really close to the surface, all the way around, you know, on the perimeter of that lovely uh, root ball. Um, it's a 360 degree um, area of possibility where you can find truffle and, and, and sometimes very, very deep. Um, but I don't ever dig very deep. I always only dig maybe two or three inches because there's always enough for my purposes on the surface. I don't want to go and be intrusive and, you know, uh, uh, negatively impact that relationship between the tree and, and, the, and, and its organism because it's there for a purpose. Um, not just to give us truffles or the animals truffles, it's to also help the tree, as we all know now with mycorrhizal associations. Um, we, we know more and more and more about the wonders of that. Um, so that's why I don't dig deep. Um, and also I know that I'm leaving stuff behind, you know, for future generations of reproduction, for animals that, you know, if they want to dig deep, they're entitled to it. It's part of their, it's part of their, uh, habitat the way of living and you know uh, that's fine excellent um and what are some common myths around truffles specifically or mushrooms or foraging that you tend to uh, be familiar with that you know common myths that people have around truffles and fungi um common myths oh that's quite a good question i don't know you stumped me a bit on that i mean uh, quite often people talk about, you know, um, r- rules about the safety of mushrooms. Now, it's the only thing I can think of in the way of sort of myths that um, people can be misguided by people that have put in what they call to be rules about mushrooms. Things like, oh, if you rub it with a silver spoon, you know, the silver spoon will go black or... Uh, uh, avoid anything with white gills, uh, um, which you know, fine. Uh, but it's it's not it's not necessarily good information because just that in itself could, you know, you could go and eat uh, a, a false morel, which could kill you. It doesn't have gills at all, you know, just by the fact that you've just gone by the rule of not eating anything, you know, with to avoid anything with white gills. There are so many other different poisonous mushrooms that come in so many different forms, and mm. you know. 
um, that it's just, there are no rules about mushrooms. There are none. Each species of mushroom is unique in its own right. You know, the job that it does with, within the environment, its hosts, its ID features, um, you know, they're all so unique, aren't they? And you use the word specific a lot when I'm teaching about fungi. Um, so really to be safe, you just have to, there are no rules. Uh, it, it's just about learning to learn how to identify things and learning when, you know, um, it's probably best not to eat that one because, <laughs> you know, the ID features are saying no, you know, it's like got an Amanita base or, you know, some real... It's about teaching people how to ID fungi safely, I think, and, and, and showing people probably the, the, the best way is to show them what's poisonous first. Um, mm -hmm. Because then, you know, there's, there are some alarm bells that would always raise um, your suspicion that it could be a poisonous mushroom, for example, with Amanita, just because it does have some distinguishing features that don't always mean it's poisonous, but you know it's a big like alarm bell like check this mushroom out a lot closer because it's displaying some of the features that you know are attributed to poisonous mushrooms um unfortunately not all poisonous mushrooms have those attributes um but uh, yeah myths i mean i mean i'm sure there's old myths about uh, the negativity of of mushrooms and um the magical properties of you know spiritual um mythology about mushrooms i mean it's, it's a huge subject um one that to be honest i haven't really looked at enough I need to look at that a bit closer are people always surprised when they um learn that you can actually find gourmet truffles in the uk when you when you take them on the hunts and things like that very much so and especially when i first started because it, you know i think it was me and a couple of others that were you know, um, making it known that they were out hunting truffle. Um, and only a couple of us that were actually giving the experience of truffle hunting to people, you know, two or three of us, um, and maybe one other person that was a dog trainer, you know, Marion Dean at the time. Yeah. Um, so it was very niche. I mean, you know, we were really doing something that hadn't been done in the UK for a very long time, especially not on a, on a commercial basis where you're, you know, being paid to take people out and giving them this opportunity to go and hunt truffle in the UK. Yes. Most people would be like, truffles in England? Really? No, don't be daft. They'd be like, yes, they've been here a long time. We've got 38 native species, actually. They'd be like... You know, and some people still think I'm talking about chocolates. I mean, in the early days, you know, they didn't even know what a truffle was. So truffle awareness has um, come a long way. Uh, and I don't speak to many people these days that think that I'm talking about chocolates, which is really hugely encouraging. Because believe you me, there were quite a lot of people that really did, you know, didn't even know what truffles were. Mm. Um, but for the UK, yeah, definitely. And in my early years of research, some people were very cagey about you know what they told you very suspicious uh it was still quite a clandestine uh secret society feeling about it you know and getting misled information and very strange um it still is a bit it still is a bit like that um uh, only unfortunately because of the value i mean we don't see so much of the negative side in the UK yet. Um, Fingers crossed, but, yeah. No, I know, but, you know, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not great. There's always a negative when, side. When, I, yeah, I was going to say, when money's involved, there's, there's greed involved, and, you know, I guess that always has the potential to uh, manifest in negative ways, which... Well, yeah, blood truffles, blood mushrooms. I even suggested that to someone just recently and they laughed at me. Um, but, you know, uh, Lactarius, Deliciosa, they, 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 people are getting killed over them in Spain. What, um, what, is, what is that? Um, so yeah, people are picking... Um, uh, uh, oh, my goodness, my brain's just gone dead. Uh, you're going to have to cut this bit out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all right. And it's, it's, a, it's a mushroom. Is it or is it a type of it, yeah, like Lactarius delici yes, Lactarius deliciosa is one of the one of the milk caps, it's, oh, which yeah. is one of the most favoured gastro milk caps. You know, uh, what's Saffron it called in cap. English? Saffron milk Saffron cap. Saffron milk cap. Cap. Yeah. Oh my god, um, I've been out of England way too long. You can tell. At least That's I know right, the yeah, Latin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Um, so 
you know, they're, they're, they're very highly prized in Spain and there's been some troubles. Uh, I was reading a big article two or three years ago about, you know, the competition of the, of the commercial hunters and uh, it's becoming a bit cloak and dagger and, you know, thinking, and, and, and the title of the article was Blood Mushrooms. And it's like, God, mm. really? And, all, you know, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I don't even really want to be involved in something that's got that sort of connotation. Yeah. You know, I didn't choose this as a subject to suddenly have all of this darkness around, you know, this subject. And, and you know, even politically, it's been uh, quite a difficult subject in England, hasn't it? With all the anti-foraging and, and this and that. And it, it, it gets complex. It gets complex and misunderstood. And um there's still a lot of educating that needs to be done, you know, in, in, in with a view about mushroom hunting and, and um, foraging in general, I think. And Whilst we're on this subject, because I don't think I've, I've addressed it so far and there's different things out there, but obviously with your background in, and passion for sustainability and the fact that you're a professional forager, uh, maybe for a UK citizen, like what is the right and appropriate way to, you know, as a amateur, not commercially, go out and forage for, I guess, let's say mushrooms. What is the, you know, the ideal way? Like how should someone do it with respect to the environment and I guess land? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, there's a few things to to, to perhaps check first. I mean, you know, uh, places like the New Forest and all that, they're making it incredibly difficult for people to go and forage there. Um, I think partly some of the reasons behind that is they never really give you the full story. There are uh, a lot of the New Forest is actually protected. You know, it's got um, triple SIs on there. And I think perhaps a lot of people that, it's not their job or it's maybe just a small part of a pastime, you know, they maybe just want to go and collect a few sets for one meal. You know, um, they're not going to be looking at before going out to see if the woodland that they've decided to go to has got any protection on it. Um, as a forager, I, I, if I'm going to a new woodland, I'll do the research on it to see whether it's got, you know, a bylaw on there protecting it, what it's protecting it from, what's protected, what the triple SI is there in place for, you know, where the boundaries are. Um, just because I, I want to know a little bit more about the history of, of the woodland or the place that I'm going um, uh, and, and what things are potentially threatened in there, why the protection's there. Um, it might not be so obvious to the layman that if they're picking something, that it might have a negative, although they might not be picking the thing that's protected, but they might be taking something from that community that affects the thing that's protected. So it's about understanding the ecology. And it, not everybody understands the ecology. So they, they might go in and think, oh, well, I'm not picking the lilies, but I'm going to go and take that. You know, um, it's... And I think a lot of the problems within the new forest have been because of that. The stems from that is that just people that just laymen that are just doing it for a hobby are going in, in areas perhaps where they shouldn't, they haven't really been doing the homework. So as a result, a lot of heavy picking has been, you know, going on in these areas where, you know, perhaps these are areas that should be treated like nature reserves, but nothing goes on in there. Do you know what I mean? Just leave mm. it and go to the areas where there aren't any, um, there's plenty of them in the new forest. There's plenty of areas that haven't got protection on that are just as equally as good as places that have, obviously, you know. Um, so, uh, I don't know, you know, if you're living in the country, just get 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 friendly with your local landowners and your, and your farmers and say, look, I'm an enthusiast. I'm just starting out. I want to learn. If I find anything that's edible, you know, I'm willing to share it with you or, you know, I always like to ask for permission in whatever situation I'm in, regardless of whether it's personal. I mean, obviously I have to if it's commercial, but um, even on a personal level, because in my, from my experience, it's, it's just served me well for lots of reasons. I've gained a new friend most of the time. I think the respect that you get from the landowner, they'll be so shocked that you go and ask them if, if, if you know, you can have permission to even cross their land on a footpath and maybe just venture off the footpath a bit because 
actually when you venture off the footpath you're actually on private land mm. and depending on how nice the farmer is or woodland owner is will either say wait get back on the footpath because that's private property as soon as you step off it you can't really forage like that just on a footpath really so you need to have you know a bit of flexibility so to be able to get that flexibility i'll i'll, I'll ask if i can have it and um strike up hopefully a good relationship because they're so amazed that you've asked for permission because a lot of people just skip over the fence and don't give a damn and they you know they get a 12 ball waved at them and get off my land and <laughs> shot in the air <laughs> you've got to jump over a fence i know that doesn't happen very often but but you know it could do if you get an arsy an arsy farmer um and i i just it doesn't it doesn't help overall relations for the long term for the future if, if people do that a lot um and i think you know there are a lot of foragers that will just go oh, so i'm just skipping over that thing look i've done it myself you know i think we all have but um to make it as your general practicing you know way of of conducting yourself i don't think it's probably the best way um so yeah i'll always ask because also uh, you, you, you uh, for me it's really important to know the history of the land as well where where i can um and if you if you get friendly with the landowner they're going to tell you oh well actually we've been putting a lot of chemicals you know over there or that field's got anthrax don't don't go and uh pick your your, your fairy ring champignon from over there because you know and there's a you know um there's so many different things agriculturally and industrially that have happened in the countryside that we can't even see anymore. Mm. Um, but if you get that history from the locals in the pub and your landowners and try to get a good, you know, vision of how organic really these woodlands are that you're, you know, hunting in or pasture or wherever you are. Is there a best way of making that first contact with the private landowners because this is something that i've thought well yeah of course that makes so much sense because at least in the uk there's there's so much private land compared to public access land and currently i think maybe probably out of fear and it's much easier just to avoid that subject and go and find the public access land um but actually you know it's 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 something that i guess if we had a way of doing it like what what is your best way of contacting a land loaner um and then yeah asking for permission i, I cheekily want to say i just keep going over the fence till i get caught and then i go <laughs> oh i'm in time to see you yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which you know um, that's one approach yeah we, we've all done it you know but, 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 but then you know they're like they're, they're happy that you're seem to be really keen to go and talk to them as opposed to going, oh, I'm running away with my basket of mushrooms and now you can't have them, you know. Um, I prefer that that approach. Um, and, yeah. you know, I will I will go uh, to the nearest pub to a woodland that I like and, and, and ask the barman, do you know who owns that copse down the road? You know, that mm. nice chestnut bit of uh, um, plantation down there or... Um, or I ask anyone that I see in the village or and, and then failing that, if you really can't find out who it is, you know, for a fiver on land registry, you can find out who these landowners are. And and I've done that numerous times because they've woods, you know, private woodlands that I know there's truffle in there. And I cannot for love nor money find the landowner. And I really want to go in there. And yeah. I've done it that way as well. That's brilliant. I such a simple thing I, I knew there was something like that um obviously i think the pub one sounds much more exciting uh, to do that <laughs> one but uh land registry awesome yeah i think i need yeah. to i think 2022 i need to start doing that this year especially because i look you know i've got the os map on my phone and that's typically how i'm now finding areas nearby or suitable areas which are yeah. typically a drive away because we haven't got any limestone chalk at the moment i'm trying to do some scouting yeah. for when the season comes but um yeah it would be so much easier if I just included private land in my uh, searching as well. And then just, um, so thanks for giving me, giving me the, uh, the, the prompt there. I think <laughs> for some reason I was just building it up as this big thing. Like I probably did have a picture of a, uh, a farmer with a shotgun over his back. And like, <laughs> Get off my land. You're not coming in. You see, you do see some pretty scary things uh, when you're out and about, you know, signposts like um, there was one in particular 
Well, if you can read this, and this is in the middle of the woodland with uh, maybe a fence on one side and then private land on the other side. But the message on the sign was, if you can receive, if you can read this, you are now in range of our uh, rifles. You are now <laughs> oh, in range God. of our rifles. What? Oh, no, well, that's really not nice, you know. It's it's scary. Yeah. Um, so 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 yeah, I've even laminated um, uh, a little note <laughs> with all my details on there, going, look, I love your woods. You know, uh, I come in here occasionally, find some nice mushrooms, but I'd like to use it to run some courses. Would you be interested? And I'll give you a percentage. And, you know, um, so I've done that quite a lot and, and, and left laminated notes in woods for the landowner or the wood, you know, the, um, uh, what do you call them? The um, uh, grounds, the g gamekeepers or the groundsmen to, 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 to find them, you know, and hopefully they get in touch. Some do, some don't. Why has foraging been an impact how has foraging been an impact on your life and why sh why in your opinion do you think more people should learn to forage um uh, it's been a, a massive impact on my life without really realizing how initially how uh restorative it is and 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 a form of meditation um uh just getting back out there you know touching the soil smelling the soil grounding yourself with the soil you know it's it's clean dirt isn't it it's dirt that we that we have become so far removed from um nature in general frighteningly so um sometimes you don't really realize how much so for people that are city dwellers you know mm. um when you're living in the country you know you just sort of almost take it for granted and especially when you do things like I'm doing you know it's suddenly a big part of my life but having come from the city I can see how easy it would be to to really if you I mean if you don't leave the city you're really alienated from a huge part of what's going on out there uh, nature and um so I think almost intuitively subconsciously for me I was always drawn to it and always gave me pleasure. And I think I've always known that. And, you know, my saddest, darkest times, like, you know, I've always had dogs. So I'd always be out walking. And there'd be times when, you know, I could be really miserable and just suddenly go into the woods, walk the dogs. And after a couple of hours, come back, feel so much better. Hmm. And not even really realise, you know, how much better that walk made me feel until all of a sudden you're like, oh, OK, OK, thank you, you know it all falls into place and you realize and you realize the things that make you happy and for me do you know who couldn't be happy looking at the wonders of nature and the design and the glory and the beauty and the forever learning and keeping your mind constantly ticking every time you go out i mean that's you know it's a huge um syllabus isn't it out there i mean it's mm -hmm. like <laughs> If there's always something new to learn or something to look at closer um and for me that's uh I, you know that's that's just amazing and it keeps that passion alive and that interest alive and the mental health flowing long term i think and once i really realized that for my own self you know then i sort of incorporated that a bit into the courses and you know making people aware of this is not just going to look for, you know, something nice to put on your plate or, you know, great on your pasta tonight. Take this as a whole, you know, experience really of being out with nature and, and feeling the benefits of nature and go and take a little time out on your own away from the group for 10 or 15 minutes, you know, after lunch and find a little sunny, dappled sunny spot and really feel it and really feel this orchard and, the truffles and imagine the animals hunting the truffles and sitting on their little stumps and nibbling away at truffle and you know all of these things just try to immerse in it try to, to feel it so that when maybe you go back home to maybe up in the Chilterns well another truffle area you can recognize what you learned here today and you know how good it made you feel and and um I mean I get some of the most amazing compliments after some of my courses just things that I never really thought I would ever really hear people say to me in the sense that, you know, 
we're never going to walk into woodlands and feel the same way again you know in a positive no I might like to have not because I've been going around smelling badger poo all afternoon <laughs> <laughs> um, you know and that's amazing that that just gets your your you know goosebumps going and it's hugely rewarding and to be able to share that is amazing just you know for me on in a, on a selfish note you know it's it's incredible to do a job that is so rewarding and that gives pleasure to so many people and I feel so lucky and it's just by complete fluke and just because I love what I love that it happened that way it, it, you know it it wasn't in so much intended that it would have such a an impact but it just does naturally I you know it's got absolutely nothing to do with me it's just <laughs> it's just the subject isn't it it's just mm. nature it's just <clears throat> and when you know a little bit about it and you can harness it a little bit and you can share it and you can raise awareness to me that's really really valuable and you know that's why I'm missing it so much because I'm not doing it and not as much as I'd like to I have done a little bit this year but not truffles but mushrooms on the kinto which has been great so dipping back into the water and it's been really nice and so yes how does it because obviously you're in Portugal at the moment and um sort yeah of currently sort of time has hit pause on the UK side of your business and everything for now but what are you doing to stay um or, or what is Portugal like at the moment for as is it is it is there truffles around you is there mushrooms near you how, how else are you sort of scratching your itch as a as a forager you know uh, foraging in your blood yeah I mean it's been really interesting because it's completely the opposite to what I'm used to here in the sense that you know in England I'm on the chalk I'm on high pH alkaline soil here it's the polar opposite it's uh, really acidic granite um, no gourmet truffles as such um, we have terfairs there's a desert truffle here um, in the spring that's going to be around soon in the next couple of months is it something um, you would eat or is that just... yes oh absolutely oh, yes yeah. it's, it's it's not at all truffly it has no phenolic compounds to give it those truffly smells which in, to be honest is what people are looking for when they eat truffle mm. so I was obviously at first a little bit disappointed and went you call this a truffle <laughs> you know um but actually um it's a very good subterranean mushroom and if you don't think of it as a truffle and you eat it as a subterranean mushroom it's really mushroomy it's got a lovely flavor it's very nice it's really good with eggs um, but it's not a truffle and it, you know it goes for eight euros a kilo mm. so you know I think even penny buns you know sets go for more than eight euros a kilo yeah. um, so it's sort of you know it just it depicts the, the the truffliness that it has it doesn't have any but it's got huge medicinal properties um, as do all fungi and truffles as well truffles too and so what about the acidic soil? Is that is that meaning that mushroom, mushrooms in general are a lot lower in abundance out there? Sorry, uh, I did track it, didn't I? Um, no, no I've been, <laughs> I've been um, really fortunate with the fungi presence here. And oh, again, great. because um, it's different soil and different tree species and things like that, I'm finding things that, you know, um, I've never seen before. Wow. So that's been in, in, it, really, really interesting um what sort uh, of things uh things like uh amanita cesarea oh uh, i was gonna just, ask that question yeah, you can't get that in really, the uk can you no what, no what's the common name is that the caesar's mushroom so yeah caesar mushroom yeah. yeah caesar's mushroom amanita cesarea which is a stunning mushroom beautiful mm. really the colors you know bright orangey red with this really vivacious yellow and I mean, you know, you can't go wrong. I mean, it's just, it's really stunning. Um, what other things? Oh, things that are on the red data list um, in England mm. um, that I'm finding abundantly here. Things oh. like uh, um, Scordone. Um, uh, it's, like the type, it's like a hedgehog fungus. It's got all oh, the yeah, spine. Yeah. Um, and there, the, you know, the tiered, tiered layer, like a tiered tooth fungus or something. That it's not that. a tiered tooth. Oh, and on the top of my head, the uh, the Latin, um, yeah, I, I don't know. something. <laughs> yes, 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 it is. And um, you know, they're on the they're on the vulnerable list in the UK, and yeah. here they're in every pine uh, wood. 
you know, wow. just tripping up over them. And they're huge and really stunning mushrooms, big, robust. Um, what else? This, this, um, that's the um, same family as the lion's mane. Is that correct? You know what? You're making me get my book Horatio. out I'm now. Making ben. You get your book, yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I think, I think it is the uh, Horatium uh, family of mushrooms. Um, uh, I'm still, I'm still very much a novice when it comes to the learning the Latin names, but um, you've got to start you know somewhere. What? You know what? There's so much information, isn't there, with Frankie yeah. to have to remember. Not just the Latin names, not just their common names, but their whole, all the information, all the ID information, you know, you have to remember. So it's hardly surprising you've got to go out with your book, to be quite honest, yeah. you know. I mean, even Roger went and out sometimes with Sometimes several books. But several yeah. books, but I, I love always feeling, you know, there's always an element in all of us that feels sort of slightly, uh, oh, you know, I've got the fear, the charlatan fear, you know, that you don't feel you, you, know, you know as much as you should know. You know, you always that yeah. imposter syndrome, it's called. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and you're always a bit like, oh, God, oh, God. Partly because the subject that we've chosen is huge. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. And every mushroom has at least, I don't know, 12 or 7 or 10 ID features that you have to remember per mushroom. I love that and you're like, saying this because uh, I, I definitely feel like, I should know more. I should know more. How can I get? How can I start a podcast? How can I put content out? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what that is. I don't know what this is. But I'm sort of, you know, trying to reframe it and see, like, well, I'm just going to talk about it and share it and uh, not yeah. pronounce myself as an expert. Probably, well, ever. you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think we do. I think you know, um, we're all. If anyone says to me, "You are a mycologist," or well, "I'm not a mycologist," no, I'm an amateur mycologist. Doesn't yeah. matter how much I know. You know, I didn't do a mycology degree, so no, I'm not. I'm mm -hmm. purely amateur. But some of the best stuff comes from amateurs as well. Huh? Mm -hmm. You know what their input and their knowledge and and, and their passion and uh, uh, you know we. It, it would be very different without all of us amateurs um, contributing what we contribute. And there is no shame in, in going out with a book. And I, I went out on a, a, a foray with Roger. And yes, admittedly, he was in his latter years. And I'm sure that our memory will all fail us when we're in our 90s. But you know yeah. what? I was like, Roger, I love you so much. You're going out with your own book. I love it. You're amazing. I will never feel shameful again about going out with the book. And, you know, and behind the scenes, we're all like, you know, out in the woods, and like, yeah, 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 you know, we know all our stuff, which of course so many people do, and, and far better than me. And, you know, incredible some of the minds in the mycology world. Mm. I mean, um, I could really reel off a whole load of names who are guys who are just, you know, incredible. Um, and, uh, you know, but, 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 and they just go out as confident as anything. And, 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 you know, but also behind the scenes, even those people, we're all in our books. You know, yeah. we have to rely upon our books. And, you know, at home, we're all like, dee -dee 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 -dee, looking stuff up and double checking on the microscope. Because you can't always tell what things are out in the field. It's impossible sometimes. No, definitely. And the yeah. DNA sequencing oh. side of things is, uh, you know, you can't, I've, I've watched endless amounts of videos on that as well. And I'd love to, uh, you know, one day, you know, that can be a massive hobby, I think, you know, because the, the tools and equipment that you need to actually do it now are with, within, you know, m you know, within reach in terms of price tags. So it's uh, that's something that I definitely want to interview some people uh, future in this podcast who are there's one guy I'm completely blanking on his name. But um, yeah, some American guy who's paid to go and forage uh, magic mushrooms all day, all year. <laughs> and and he so he's obviously fascinated by them um i'm really blanking on his name it'd be good to remember it but um but yeah no so just it's just an uh, you're right it's just a massive massive subject you know there's the whole you know identifying mushrooms and i'm really interested in the whole medicinal side of mushrooms as well um you know as you yeah. said i think pretty much every mushroom has at least some medicinal properties but then there's obviously the big the big ones as well and then there's the whole research into, you know, the, the psychedelic side of things. And, um, you know, it's almost a shame that there was a, a generation's worth of research lost because of, you know, the illegalization of, of 
of of it because imagine where we would be now if um, uh, it yeah was crazy. Really, sad. really sacrilege really i mean honestly um it was scar codon but i think that might be an old name for it now um is this going back to the other mushroom on the, the red hedgehog. list that you found yes. oh, okay yes. okay cool uh, well well brought family. back there you know definitely <laughs> diving down a few rabbit holes there <laughs> yeah so you've so, definitely yeah. been able to uh maintain that uh, or scratch that itch for you in in portugal i guess it sounds amazing to be very, able to find very new much species so. yes i mean let's face it there's mushrooms everywhere aren't there you know yeah. in every habitat even coming up through the cracks in the pavement you know in in the cities sometimes they're everywhere if you know where to look um it's just about whether they're good to eat, depending on certain habitats that you can't getting them from. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm in the mountains. Um, we've got monoculture, which we all hate, but for mushrooms, it can be quite good. Um, back to dogs, truffle dogs, truffle hounds. Yeah. Um, in your experience, when because um, because obviously you train people how to how to train their dogs, and um, what are some of the common mistakes that uh, you know either you made in the beginning or that you see a lot of people making when it comes to training their dog to hunt for truffles um i think the thing that's maybe that i've seen the most and is slightly annoying and, and a bit irritating is that <laughs> some people expect their dogs to be able to just be truffle hunters after like you know, a couple of sessions mm. or they've been training their dog at home for two or three months. And then they come out with me um, for the first time in the woods and they, and they sort of expect their dogs to be finding truffle on the first time out. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I've got a really good track record and most of the dogs that I do take out on the first time out, um, as long as the owners have been doing, you know, the, 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 the homework, mm -hmm. um, and they're of a certain standard um, because they've maybe done a course with me initially and then they've practiced. And then, then we go out after maybe six months or a year um, to put that practice into real life training. Um, and sometimes I, I've seen people a little bit um, impatient with their dogs mm. and not be nasty with their dogs, but a bit like fed up with their dogs and a bit like, oh, you know, come on, come on, you're not working hard enough, come on, come on. And you're a yeah. bit like, mm, come on, guys. Which they'll like, pick up on, right? You know, back off, back off. Yeah. You know, it's not cool. Uh, it took me a long time to train my first dog. And, and admittedly, the other two that have followed up behind have been a lot quicker for lots of different reasons. That They had a dog to follow, uh, to copy. Um, I knew all the habitats by then. You know, when I first started with Zeb, it was training a dog in areas that I didn't know whether there were truffle or not. You know, and it wasn't only until much later with all the experience that I had that I could clearly identify places which I knew had truffle um, and would then worry me if he wasn't maybe harvesting as many as I thought he should be, you know, but they just get better and better and better, the dogs, mm. um, as their skills and, and their confidence. And so they're like us, you know, we're the same thing, you know, you learn the knowledge and then you go out, you know, a bit trepidatiously and, and then the more you do it, you, you, you know, you get the confidence and then you get cocky. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's it's a journey and um so yeah that's that's the only thing I, I think that i've seen with people that get slightly just impatient um people can make lots of mistakes in their training um which was going to slow them down and these are things that i like to point out to them that mm, you know okay he's working on your scent or uh things that i put in place to you know, avoid certain common mistakes happening. Oh, was that a, wa um, a waggling dog tail there in the background? Yeah, <laughs> she's so fed up with that with that plastic cone on her head. She's probably all itchy. Oh. But yeah, um, so just just things like that. Um, Were you referring to yeah. uh, like cross contaminating the scents with hands and things like that, like human scent, and and then expecting them to pick that out the truffle happen. scent, but actually they're not. They're picking out the your scent that can happen they don't know whether they're what they're supposed what they're getting rewarded for whether it's the truffle or your scent and things like that um so you have to put corrective training in place to to make sure that that doesn't happen um and it can be quite hard if you've been training a dog quite a long time like that to to, to, to break them out of their out of bad habit um 
So yeah. Uh, and and on that, I, th I have like one more technical, tactical question. I I think I read or listened to you say one time that um, maybe with your first dog, you went down the route of you know training them to dig out and dig at the truffle um and then i think this is a while back that i think i digested this info but i think you were actually more of the mind of you know you you prefer to actually focus on the indication rather than digging or you know can you speak to that and what would you what are one or two of the things that you would do to um folk get the dog to to do it the right way if there is or what the right way is um, it really depends on on, on on what you want. I, I think I've been in, in different sort of minds about this, really. Um, I actually quite like my dogs to dig. Mm. Um, for me, as soon as I, you know, it's it's about being really observant all the way through in, in, in every realm with this, you know, looking for mushrooms, watching your dog, watching their body language uh especially with a with a, a young dog you know their indications can be not very clear um and you sometimes have to watch the last sniff and if it looked like a really sniff that looked a bit more interesting than a normal sniff then mm. i'd be going to sniff that spot too and if, if the dog's just being lazy and yes it smelt it and you could recognize that it smelt it but just chose to leave it behind because there was a squirrel up the road or, yeah. you know, or a better smell around the corner or something. It just decided to leave it. But you could just tell by that certain sniff, she lingered a bit longer or something or jetted you a look or, um, you know, uh, I'd be going to investigate that, which some dogs in the, in the, in commercial situations where, uh, where they don't want the damage, the truffles to be damaged in any shape or form. So some uh, truffiers, commercial plantation owners, if they're harvesting their truffles to sell on the market, they don't want to lose any money at all. So if yeah. the truffles they want to avoid scratch, like dogs, yeah, dog scratches and or, then it's marks. not going to be a triple A truffle. You know, it's going to yeah. be maybe a double A. Um, but then you hear some people saying, well, we like to see the dog paw marks in it because it shows that they've been sustainably harvested. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it's all marketing, isn't it? <laughs> it's so difficult. You know, um, a dog, we use dogs because they're sustainable. Why? Why? Why, in your opinion, do you think it's sustainable to use dogs? Oh, because they don't harvest immature truffle. Mm. Well, they do, yeah. actually. For me, what makes hunting with dogs sustainable is that they will mark the spot whether it's by sitting or by digging or with his nose to show you where the the, the truffle is if they're sitting you really have to observe the last place they smelt mm. because sitting where's the truffle you know yes you sat close to it but i've got to poke around here i've got to poke around there are you sitting on it um you know it's like it's not very clear and in these moments, you or I would get on my hands and knees and I'd start smelling around the dog, around the yeah. ground to see, you know, I would probably actually notice where it last sniffed and I would probably go straight to it. But that's, you know, through years of, of, of experience. Um, you know, I watch my dogs like hawks. You have to, to really understand your dogs and, and to know where, if your dog is a sitter, where the truffle is. It's, it's going to be the last place it's sniffed. And if you don't see that, then you're going to be randomly sort of searching around a bit. And that's a bit... Mm. If the paw goes on it, goes to dig, the very spot the paw is on is where the truffle is. So there's no random searching. And for me, that's what makes using dogs sustainable. Yeah. Awesome. And which one of your lovely canine companions was it that um had an incident with your fridge and uh, some truffles <laughs> and can you can you share what happened exactly uh that was Zebedee I mean he must have been about five or six I think so well a fully fledged truffle hunter um and we'd had a particularly good day I think I had about a kilo of truffle in the fridge and I just woke up one morning 
blurry eye, came down the steps, kitchen door was just sort of on my right, and I noticed that the fridge door was not completely closed. I was like, oh, goodness me, I'm going to have to go and investigate that bloody dog. And I'd had a kilo of truffle in there, and I opened the fridge door, and everything had gone, the butter, the kilo of truffle, the bacon, but a whole kilo of truffle. I mean, Labradors for you. I mean, you know, they eat, don't they, everything and anything. And, and he loved he loved truffle. But, and, I, and I had to tell him he was a good boy because when you're training a dog, you know, uh, it, you can't do anything that's negative. Mm. You know, I never tell my dogs off when I'm training, even if they do something wrong. And I, don't, I try not to use the word no. I'll just be, you know, a bit coercive, coercive and, you know, get them to think about something else as opposed to, you know, Give, giving them any sort of negative vibes because uh, it's, it's all got to be about fun and games. You don't want to do anything to, 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 to give them the slightest reason not to like truffle hunting. You know what mm. I mean? It's um, You really don't, nothing to put them off in any shape or form. So, I, you know, I couldn't really tell him off. I was like, oh, oh good boy, good boy, good boy, you found your truffles in that fridge, good boy. <laughs> and we, we, at the time, were you uh, were you selling these truffles on to people or uh, was that was that a bit of lost I, revenue for you <laughs> uh well probably a little bit um uh, yeah probably uh you know I always use them for one reason or another whether it's for my own personal use or whether it's for training dogs with or you know selling a couple here and there um yes you know preserving in salt uh using on a course yeah, there's so many reasons I use the truffles that I have left over from courses that that just keep going and you know uh, will be used for other courses as well or for one of the meals on a course or you know yeah so yes yeah, slight loss revenue <laughs> what does what does a um I'm just curious what does a what does going on a truffle course with with you look like or entail like what does a typical day if you're if someone's sort of signing up to come with Melissa to go truffle hunting Okay, well, we, we, we obviously meet in the, in the secret location. The secret location, the undisclosed I'd, I'd, location. I'd love to blindfold everybody, you know, before going. <laughs> it's completely impossible, but I'd love to be able to do that. Um, um, and uh, I introduce myself. I usually have a little coffee or something to whet the appetite um, before the course, get everyone in the mood, have a chance to, you know, introduce everyone to everybody. Um, I then tend to sort of get out the car park as quickly as possible because it's not a great place to hang out. So it's sort of like, come on, guys, mm. just get your stuff and let's let's get into the woods. So we're walking up and, and, you know, people start talking to one another on the walk up a bit and try not to talk about too much um, mushroomy or truffly. Don't want to lose, you know, the, the message. Till we get to a nice little place in the woods that's pretty quiet mm. where there's a likelihood of having truffle underneath my feet as I'm talking. Um, and um, and often that has that has happened, you know. I'm in the middle of the intro talk, and I've got Zebedee or one of them digging sort of literally underneath my heel, and that has happened. And I'm, I'm like, sorry, guys, hang on a second, <laughs> and literally just pull out a truffle. Um, so so then I do like the intro talk. Um, try to because people come with different knowledge of fungi, mm. so you know. Um, I try to cover from as uh, subjects su the subject for people who've got very very limited knowledge don't even know that you know uh, fungi are in their own kingdom you know mm. that limited knowledge to uh, people who have already you know been doing it for some years so it's difficult to to try to you know cover all that information but I but I try I give a broad description of what we're looking for. Um, what the habitat is, I talk about the soil, I talk about the, the whole woodland ecology really, you know, from the help to the trees and, and vice versa, the trees for the fungi and uh, what the food chain is, give a good example of all the types of animals that are associated within the world of truffle, from the truffle beetles to all the rodents that we talked about earlier and, and how they reproduce. I mean, you, you wouldn't even think that, you know, um, for example, say uh, a dormouse that's eaten truffle that then gets preyed upon by a bird of prey. The bird of prey then eats the dormouse and will eat the truffle contents in the stomach. And actually birds of prey are probably eating truffle and dispersing uh, spores. You know, it's, it's when you really start thinking about all mm. the different, you know, 
journeys that this truffle could go on. <laughs> it's a well-traveled truffle, it really is. Um, and that in itself is fascinating. Um, so I give a good broad picture of all the tree species that, you know, that are host to truffle, um, the dappled light, the orientation, all these things, you know, make people look at and feel and smell and touch. Um, and then we go off hunting. Um, and then it's about really appreciating the dogs at work and yeah. watching them, you know, in, in themselves is just... And well, at that I point, are you, are you sort of less focused on the people and more like tuned into the dog? It's really hard, you know. I, yeah, I can imagine that's a bit of a, you know... It's, yeah. it's, it, it's got better with experience. And sometimes people don't, I think, really realise how... I sometimes need a quiet moment and, and not people talking to me to, to get the best productivity out of the day yeah. sometimes, you know, and especially on days where, you know, perhaps it's not a very good season. People have been talking to me all morning and the dogs haven't really found anything and then it's lunch and then it's like, oh God, I'm getting twitchy. We've not found <laughs> anything, you know, and then you're like, I don't look, I don't care even if you just find one truffle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get to that point where like, just one just one, a sign of one, you know, so that I can prove that, you know, this, I haven't taken a hundred quid off you, you know, for nothing, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it gets a bit, it can get a bit, you know, but that, that also comes with confidence and, you know, uh, I didn't put my dog or myself onto the, onto the market, if you like, until I was a hundred percent sure that I could look at someone in the eyes at the end of a foray when we hadn't, found one truffle or someone's paid me you know a few hundred quid to go and do a woodland survey and we found nothing you know mm. we've been there five or six hours and everything's right the soil's right the tree species are right you know it looks like it they should have but they don't it's really hard to look at your client in the eyes and go thank you I still want you know x amount of money come and, back next year and, and next maybe year. come back next year we'll keep trying because you're right they should be here but we've not found anything not even any visual clues, not even, you know, nothing to suggest that um, there's truffle here. You know, sometimes I go to woods and I'm certain there's truffles there and it might take 20 visits before I finally come up with truffle. But I keep going back with the knowledge that they're here, they're here. I, obviously not abundant, um, but everything's right. They should be here. They should be here. And just with perseverance. Might, might it be also, because um, just from what I'm learning over recent conversations, the estevium and un uncinatum, uh, the summer and the burgundy are, the, you know, technically the same species, but one one sort of uh, grows in the summer, one in the autumn. Yeah, what and, a fiasco that story is. <laughs> yeah. Go on, go on share, share about that. But I'm wondering you going back to the same woods and again and again, might it be the fact that actually you, you're going at different times and maybe you hit the one time where that, that particular area is, you know, conducive to an autumn time period or, or maybe it was the summer time period, but previously you've been there during the autumn or, and yeah, shed some light on the story here with the, with this species. Uh, Cause it's. You, it's, you, 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 you are right in that sense, but I think I would be going to these places with some regularity that would probably cover or all of those eventualities all of, it, yeah. of like when they would be there. Also, um, you, c you can't tell what your competition is, you know, wild or, or human, you know. You, you don't know who's been in those woods before you or it might just not be a particularly good year for them. Yeah. Um, so the, the story behind Tuba estivum and Tuba uncanatum. Yes, you're right, it's the same species, but for many years... They thought that they were two different species. I don't really know why. I really don't, mm. because even in my very, you know, uh, early years of not knowing very much, um, I, I was, I, I'm not quite sure how, but I was, I was um, invited to a round table at a, which was a very special meeting at a conference in Italy. And this was, I was maybe two years into my new, you know, subject. Yeah. So I was going to conferences and I was wanting to meet all the top people in the truffle world. And going to that conference was absolutely phenomenal for me. You know, I was straight into the door of the world of truffles and met nearly every expert there is to meet in the world. I mean, they were all at this conference. It was incredible. It was in Inverness. And I just made it my purpose just to 
be known and to know others that could help me in my quest. And um, so I got invited to this round table with all some of the six or seven of the top trufficulture and scientists to do with truffle at this special meeting, uh, just about whether this was before molecular science and DNA, really, mm. to the point where it is now. And um, they were discussing whether it was the same species or not. And I was sitting there very humble, thinking, oh, my goodness, I don't really deserve to be at this table. <laughs> I just thought... And they were discussing it and discussing it and discussing it. And I was sitting there listening intently. And uh, almost at the end of the, of the meeting, they went, and Melissa, from a truffle hunter's perspective, what do you think? And I was like, oh, my God, I've only been doing it two or three years. But from what I can tell, <laughs> I believe it's the same species. You know, you call it the summer truffle when we're in England finding it a little bit later than in Europe. But in Europe, they'd, they'd start harvesting the summer truffle in as early as late May, June. Um, and it would be a truffle that was immature and you'd cut it in half and it was white and it had no aroma and it had no, you know, no taste. And it was like eating a, an unripe pear or an unripe peach and, you know, mm. hard and nothing to it. So... And in in those days, I'd, I'd go to restaurants and have the summer truffle at the peculiar times of the year, and it would be horrible. It would be white, and it would be just horrible. It would be like, I don't understand what all the fuss is about this summer truffle. It's really not very nice. It's like, I don't get it. And then as I was hunting, starting a bit earlier in the season, around in August, or finding these white truffles, thinking, okay, and then going to the same woods a bit later in the season, more in September and October and November and the same woods, the same tree and finding the same truffles, but darker inside, you know, marbled, marbled gleba, all the soft parts, um, smelling of something, tasting of something. You're like, well, these were just immature. These were immature truffles that we were harvesting in August and, that's why they didn't taste of anything. It's because they need to be not put into two categories of the summer and the autumn truffle. It's just one bloody truffle. Leave it in the summer. Don't harvest it till the autumn. And then it's a bloody good truffle. <laughs> it's, it's, it was crazy. But again, just down to greed and commercial, uh, you know, what they can get away with and what they can charge for summer truffles and which is not very much but there's a reason it's not very much i mean the autumn truffle um sells for a lot more because it's it's eaten at the time when it's supposed to so at the round table it was just you know it was quite funny you know it was like well you know from my perspective i think it's the same truffle so we sort of came to the conclusion i think at the end of the meeting that it was the same truffle but it still needs to be backed by you know science, science yeah. really yeah. Um, and then it wasn't much longer after that, six months even, or a year maybe, then afterwards it all came to light that, yes, of course, it's the same truffle. And, and I was like, well, yes, you know, it wasn't really any big news, really. I think we already knew that. Um, uh, and now, of course, uh, it has to be referred to as Tuba Estevam Va Uncanatum. It, it has both names now. So, oh, okay. yes. Finally and firmly established. <laughs> Fascinating. So it may not be that the summer truffle is in its prime in the summer. It's the same truffle as the autumn truffle. It's just been found earlier and picked when it's not at its peak. Absolutely. That's very interesting. Absolutely. So with that knowledge, now... Part of me's like glad to know that, but part of me's thinking, oh, now I have to wait a bit longer before I can like start going out with Buddy to, you know, and just uh, wondering. So yeah. Well, you know, it's I good mean, to know. <laughs> start in late August if you're if you're harvesting white truffle, then just don't bother, and um, you know, uh, give it to someone that wants to train their dog or something. But um, just wait a few weeks and and until uh, until you start seeing them nice and marbled and, and brown in the soil that's the clue also you know nature tells you when it's the right time mm. because if you're out in the woods in early september this has happened often for me and i don't see any of my animal competition anywhere 
it's just not existent. And I and I actually like to see my animal competition because if I don't see little diggings here and there, it, to me it's saying the truffles aren't ready, they're not here, they're not ripe. Uh, just leave it a while because I know these woodlands are truffle woodlands. If I'm not getting the visual clues, it's sort of a sign that they're not really ready to be harvested. So I quite like to see that. And if I don't see that, I get a bit, again, another reason to get a bit twitchy, like, oh, what's mm. going on? What's going on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. And there's many different types of truffles that I've learned from you and from books and stuff that we can find in the UK. Um, but over your years of research and finding different truffles, um, Tell me about this, the one that you found, which wasn't in any truffle book or that it was previously, um, I don't know. T tell me about that story that you've you alluded to before. Yeah, um, it is in the book, but it's in the book and it says considered extinct. Ah. So, uh, Pachyapolis, me Melanthorus, oh goodness me, I should have had these <laughs> names in front of me. Um, <coughs> um, Yes, quite incredible, really. Um, and really highlighted something to me that, and, 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 and it's what I tell all, all, my, all my, you know, um, trainee dog trainers, uh, to handlers, is that, you know, we're entering into something that you think is just a hobby, mm. but then it becomes something so much greater. And, um, and I think when we start doing this, I don't think we really realise how deeply and um, intricately we look at things um, or need to look at things more um, and that how foraging teaches us how to look at these things much deeper and much closer and it's not just our day-to-day -day vision that we're just so used to you know flitting by and observing this and observing that but we actually really look at things so incredibly closely you know to the point of hand lenses and microscopes as we all know but just in day-to-day -day foraging you know our eyes are in, get your eyes in, get your regal eye in, um, get your mushroom eye in. Well, Zebedee indicated on, on, uh, on a spot and he was digging and digging and, and um, I couldn't see anything. And then he just put his nose on something so incredibly small. It looked like just a piece of soil, really, hmm. or maybe a worm cast or something. But because he was so specific on this tiny little thing, the size of the freckle really but then, I mean, it was just so small so I, I sort of picked up what, what I thought he was sniffing and I looked at it and I could see it had a slightly different color to the soil and and I was like I don't know what this is so most truffles at my experience then were hard so I gave it a little squeeze and when I squeezed it I mean it was tiny 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 it just went pop and I was like oh. oh but a real very obvious pop I was like, oh, look, I wasn't expecting that. I was expecting it to not even have any give, you know, just be a, a hard ball. Um, so I thought, okay, that's interesting. Did something come so out of it, it when you did that? Or? Well, I'm telling you, it was so small. It was <laughs> yeah. so minuscule. So I'm like, okay. It was like the size of a grain of a raspberry. Yeah, okay. like one little grain of one whole raspberry, like one little, it was that small. So I thought... And I, so I thought, okay, so I smelt it and it's not really sweet, like very sweet. I was like, oh, well, maybe it is like a bit of a wild raspberry that's fallen off into the ground or something. I don't know. Mm. But it smelt sweet, truffly sweet, as well as fruity sweet. It was, it was quite unusual. But it had something that still said to me truffle. So I was like, oh, well, I don't know, because I just had this little tiny bit of sticky mass between my two fingers now because I... I'd ruined it really mm. so I thought okay well I'm just going to put this sticky mass in a bit of tissue and I'm going to have a look at it under the scope later just to establish whether it's fungal or not or you know like I said I thought it could have even been a bit of fruit because it was so fruity smelling so I stuck it in my pocket forgot about it went home a couple of days later I went oh yeah I must go and check out what that was <laughs> so I get it out literally just a bit of sticky tissue really and get some of the fungal material and very small amount is all you need for the microscope. And I stuck it on there. And it was still early days for me, even using the microscope. And, you know, I'm not a scientist on the microscope by any means. You know, it takes me time, you know. 
so I'd be looking at it and looking at it and um, it kept sort of coming back to this um, mushroom, uh, this truffle species in the book that it said it was considered extinct. So I then sent other photographs to um, friends of mine who were, you know, very good on the microscope and specialists in Serbia. And she said, oh, yes, it's definitely, it's, you know, check out Pachyopolis. It's like, okay. Um, and it was, and basically, long story, it, it was something that hadn't been recorded for over 200 or more years in the UK. Um, it was a first wow. for Sussex. Um, they really, because I think there's been a, a long period where people haven't been exploring like they did in the past with nature, um, or exploring, researching. Um, and again, now we are doing that again. You know, there's there's a take up more of people getting out and wanting to learn more and finding more things as a result. So when you, when we went through that period, sort of after the first and second world war, we had a hundred years of not a lot going on really in that field. And already a lot of things had been found and discovered, and it just seemed to stop. So I think that's the reason why things haven't been found for two, three hundred years. You know, mm. um, it's been that period of time where nothing's gone on. So that was quite interesting. A woman was uh, simultaneously purposefully looking for this truffle because it was considered extinct somewhere. Oh, I don't know. Eastern Europe somewhere, maybe even Germany or I'm not sure quite where it was. And she found one because she was looking in the right habitat. She was looking for it. Um, my species specimen even was um, so small, um, ridiculously small. They do get a lot bigger than that. Hers mm. were, I think, probably 20 times the size of the things that I was finding. But nonetheless, we, you know, uh, the, the knowledge was now out that this species was you know, not to be considered extinct anymore because actually I think the same week, the same month and the same year that we found ours together, and it um, contributed towards an article in um, the Mycology News, which is the British Mycological Society um, monthly paper that comes out. Wow. And a specimen in queue. And now a book that needs to be rewritten. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Well, uh, congratulations yeah. as well. You know, that's, Thank uh, you, yeah. that's, a, that's a, a contribution to be proud of, for sure. Definitely. And I think it highlights the fact that, you know, every time since that moment and, and and other moments of finding things you know not so rare but still you know unusual for the UK you know things like tuba brumale and uh, other types of truffle that you know people weren't really finding you know um not in huge numbers or not often anyway so you know even these records are quite interesting really for the UK um but it just it just highlights that every time you go out the door you really don't ever know what you're going to find and for me, that keeps it really alive and really interesting and chomping at the bit because you're like, right, what are you going to find next? And even, you know, whatever mushroom, not just truffle, but mushrooms, truffles. Um, it's just this phenomenal. Slime molds. <laughs> yeah. All <laughs> Everything. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, um, it's just it's just a great subject for that because there's still so much to learn and find. And uh, yeah. Fascinating. Um, I just have a few final questions for you. What's your favourite type of truffle and why? Favourite type of truffle? Oh, it's got to be magnatum, really. You know, the one that goes for thousands and thousands of pounds mm. a kilo. There's a reason, not just for its, because of its uh, small habitat, which is, you know, a little pocket in Alba, a little pocket in Serbia, a little pocket in Romania. Um, uh it's it's a it's the, the habitat is very rare for this truffle to be found so of course it gains ex exclusivity because of that um but it is an amazing truffle i think for me it is the nicest truffle i do really really like it it's the white truffle the white mm. very expensive it's slightly how, garlicky it's, yeah i was going to uh, ask you how do you describe its taste it's definitely got those garlic connotations and the sweetness and the phenolic compounds all in one. And I think it's got to be the most pungent of, of truffle. I mean, I, I, I went um, 
to do a thing that I wanted to do, you know, off the off my personal bucket list, and that was to go to the Alba Festival in in Alba mm-hmm. in Italy. Um, and oh my goodness, anyone that's listening that's into truffles, I mean, it, you've got to put that on your bucket list. It is phenomenal experience. And as soon as you walk into the village, you know, you drive into the village, and you're just hit by this smell of of truffle. Really. Wow. Um, and, and then go into the enclosed market and then get a whiff in there. I mean, it's like, oh, my goodness me. It's just, it's just everyone is walking around with this huge smile on their face. You know, it's got those properties that, you know, um, keep us happy, smiling, energised. Um, it's just something about truffle. It's all about the aroma. I keep saying it. It's all about the aroma. Um, it's very special even more than eating it, I think, in a way. And what is your favourite way of eating, I guess, the white truffle, since it's your favourite? You know, I haven't really been blessed with eating it a huge amount. I mean, the only time I've really eaten white truffle is when I went to Alba and maybe a couple of other times as a kid. But um, and, but that was a good four or five days of, like, white truffle on everything. Yeah. And you know, trying it in different contexts, you know, on fish and on pasta and risotto and, you know, and they're very generous and actually don't need to have that much because it is so strong. Mm. But the funny story is that I think it was our last day and we'd had white truffle on everything and it was delicious on everything. Can't tell you really <laughs> what was better than the, than the next. But the funny thing is we, we came to the end of our meal and we were oh, just about to have pudding. Or we, pudding was put in front of us and it was a panna cotta. And we realised that, in fact, we hadn't finished the little bit of truffle that we had still under our glass cloche that was on the table, stupidly. (laughs) (laughs) And we're like, oh, we've got a bit of truffle left still. And we were sort of like all looking at each other, grinning and going, shall we? (laughs) I (laughs) shall we grate it on the panna cotta. And we were like, well, I mean, you can't waste it. You know, this is ridiculous. We're like, yes, come on, let's just grate it on the panna cotta. So we're grating it on the panna cotta. It was probably the best way of eating it out of the whole four or five days that we were there. It was so good. It was so good. We were shocked how good it was going to be because, you know, it's slightly garlicky, uh, but with the caramel and the creaminess of the panna cotta, Oh, it was really, really good. I really liked it. Wow! And was that in a restaurant or? Yeah, yeah. And so they 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 uh, they left you with a piece of the white truffle for you to shave yourself as and when you wanted on your meal, or because normally I'm uh, envi- I'm envisioning them coming around and having a close guarded, <laughs> uh, you know, right? We're going to give they, you this amount, or but no? I guess they they, they are no 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 not at all. They still because of the value of it, they do have to still be very close guarded about you know what you you pay for what you've had. Yeah. So they come initially to the table, you know, with these lovely glamorous big cloche with all the truffles, and you can pick out of maybe ten or twelve truffles under the cloche which one you want. You you can smell it. You or the chef might go, this one's really nice. You know, it's got a nice color and it's dense and it's got a lovely aroma and you know um i suggest this one and so then he'll weigh it so you choose the one that you want okay they'll weigh it before you eat it and then if you have any left i mean you know i don't think people generally as a rule have anything left they would might weigh what you have left and you know to take it off the overall price but i think you know they, they, they know what you've had because it's weighed before you eat do you remember how much that particular truffle set you guys back oh you know what it's don't be afraid to go to the alba festival because you think it's going to cost you fortune it won't if you go for three or four days um stick an extra five or six hundred quid on your spending money and you will be able to go and eat every day in a restaurant twice a day and have a truffle dish or two on every day of your holiday for maybe an extra five or six hundred quid it's not going to break the bank and like I said, it's a lot of truffles to, to make a kilo, mm. you know. So one, just shaved on something. And if it's white truffle, it's so strong, you don't need much. Um, no, you can really go and do that and not, and it won't break the bank and you'll love it. If you love truffle, you've really got to do it. It's amazing. It's really amazing. What about some of the, the other truffles that you more commonly have found in abundance over the years? The, I guess the the burgundy or uh, what's your favorite way of eating those or, or have you got any 
I'm sure you've got some simple recipes, but have you got anything that is maybe lesser known that that is also delicious? Well, when I learned that truffle goes well with sweet things, it, it, it prompted me to play around with some more sweeter dishes because we sort of generally assume that truffle goes with more savoury dishes, eggs mm. and pasta and uh, risotto, which is all delicious and under the skin of a chicken and, you know, uh, grated in butter and then the wadge of butter on your steak. I mean, you know, I could go on forever. I mean, there's just so many delicious ways. They're all delicious. Um, but I was quite curious that it went so well with sweet things. And on my courses, I would play around with ideas. I think I made um, uh, like a yogurt, um, frozen yogurt, frozen truffle yogurt. So I'd infuse the truffle for, you know, a day or two in the yogurt um, and then freeze it and then serve it. And that really infused because anything that's got fat basically so mm. the fats from eggs the fats from cheese the fats from yogurt and uh, anything like that really bring out the the you know compounds of the truffle um so and that was delicious it was slightly tart because of the because of the yogurt um but it still had that truffle in us and that worked really really well i was quite i quite was quite surprised by that and, and liked it um, and again, things like, you know, rice puddings and, um, um, what do you call it, other pudding with um, custard and bread, bread pudding, bread pudding. Bread, yeah, bread and butter pudding. Yeah, yeah. bread and bread butter pudding. pudding. Yeah, yeah because you'd, you'd infuse the truffle in the butter before putting wow. it on the bread and you'd infuse the eggs and you'd infuse the custard and, you know, and it would just be like, whoa, this is, this is nice. <laughs> so, and I've got a bit of, I'm, I've got both sweet and savoury too, but sometimes it's just nice to do things just a bit differently. Also, things like um, the yolks of eggs, you know how they preserve them in salt, and preserving those in truffle salt, mm. um, so that you've got that hard yolk, haven't you, after a few days that you can then grate on other things. Um, you know, things like that. It's, there's so much you can do, really. I didn't know about that, but that sounds epic. Um, yeah, because obviously, like you, and I think probably like a lot of people who get into this sort of space, you know, most of them that I've met are foodies first, and then <laughs> so, um, so yeah. yeah, all of this stuff is just uh, mouth watering, and I can't wait till I can go and just find my own and play around and do all these experiments and just yeah. enjoy. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Thank you for those recommendations. Brilliant. That's, that's- um, Okay. Do you have any uh, other sort of recommendations when it comes to sort of resources or, you know, books or otherwise that, that people should um, maybe start with or something else that's maybe been inspirational to you in your journey? Uh, the two books that I recommend to people, you, you can't get them anymore. So there's going to be no point in telling them, which is really, <laughs> really um, quite disastrous because I use and, and suggest them to my clients to, to get mm. the books when... when um, when they're learning from me, but they're just not in publication anymore. I'm in the middle of writing a book. I'm 20,000 words oh, brilliant. in. Brilliant. Fantastic. Um, at some point, I'll get the inspiration to start again. I haven't, I sort of started it two years ago and sort of since lockdown, which you'd think would be the perfect time to sort of pick it up again. Yeah. Stupidly, it wasn't. Um, I just think um, not the right mental sort of, you need to be in a good place to write. Uh, yeah. And it's been really challenging for all of us, isn't it? Lockdown and uh, it wasn't really the right place all the time. But I can feel it knocking at the door again. And um, especially with so many people asking me, you know, what books, what books, what books? Well, OK, come on, Melissa, you know, <laughs> let's let's get that pen to paper and do another 20,000 words and finish this book. Do you have um, a, do you have a running title for this yet or is that still in the making? Uh, oh, I, I did have jury. a title. I did have a couple of yeah, I did have a couple of titles. You know, it's been so long that I've not thought about the book. Um, no worries, no worries. I can't think just at the top of my head, but um, yes, I did, and I'm sure I've got a couple of titles written down somewhere. Um, other books, there's not a lot. I mean, there are some books on truffles, um, but that are, that are really comprehensive. Uh, there's not a lot out there, really. Not Marion Dean did a book. Um, Okay, oh, let me just put the gun and put my bookshelf in. Yeah, no, there's a big bookshelf behind. It is. Uh, yeah, Marion Dean did a book on truffles. Um, 
Um, oh yeah, that's the. I think um, the British truffle big book, all the species in it. Is that right? Uh, did that. Uh, why can't I find it? Nothing's in order. You see. Sorry. <laughs> that's um, all right. I think the best thing to do is just go on Amazon and just punch in truffles. I'm sure what's available will come up. What about uh, um, where else do you tap into to to sort of stay up to date with things that's going on in the mushroom world? Or um... yeah, I I follow quite a lot of scientific um, people on either just by communicating with them directly or or. Um, uh, on Twitter, which I don't like very much, but um, you know, you just have to follow them where they're where they're doing their things and where they're sharing information. And um, do one one or two come to mind? Yeah, uh, Marcos Morelos. He works out of Spain. He's always publishing some interesting stuff. Uh, Doctor Paul Thomas. He's he's uh, one of our English leading top um, truffle. Uh, uh, guys doctors he's he's you know he's really good he does a lot of uh, planting of trees and inoculating trees and um all over the world now started in the uk really and, and now all over the world he's great he doesn't really publish a huge amount of stuff um just just really me it's just if i've got anything to ask anyone it's just an email to someone that i know that's you know either in the industry or yeah that's brilliant now i mean thank you for those um those resources that's good and i will list the marion dean's book in the in the show notes um yeah. but that that brings us to the end and i just wanted to give you a chance to just uh, leave with any sort of final comments or suggestions or parting thoughts for anybody listening don't eat anything till you're a hundred percent sure of what it is <laughs> yeah don't munch on a hunch as they say <laughs> yes you know you can eat one you can eat a mushroom once but um but you might not get a chance to eat it again um have you, have you ever eaten anything that uh, perhaps you shouldn't have you know touching wood i i think i'm slightly on the neurotic side yeah but i prefer to be a neurotic slightly neurotic and alive than complacent and dead um <laughs> you know i love food I, I love life and a mushroom poisoning um has got to be one of the worst ways to go as well i think it being mm. incredibly unpleasant and i'm a bit of a baby i don't like being ill even when i've just got a cold so <laughs> yeah so um i've i've always been really really careful i've double checked and double checked and double checked and triple checked again and you know i don't just have one book i have five and then it's a bit like phoning a friend and phoning a mycologist and you know, until I'm really 100% sure. That, that's what I was like in the early days. I mean, you know, now I, I know how to do my own research more and, and still get stuck as well, all lazy and can't be bothered. And I'll just phone up a buddy like, hey, hey Attila, what's this? Or, you know, <laughs> Jesper, <laughs> I haven't seen this, but oh, yes, of course. Oh, why didn't I look at that? You know, um, but just be careful. Just be careful out there. That's all I can say. And if you're careful, it's the best pastime ever and you know keeps you fit keeps you mentally healthy uh keeps you interesting um it's just all good and and lovely to be great cook all the lovely things that 95 or 98 percent of the population aren't eating we are <laughs> <laughs> and i think that's really cool too <laughs> awesome and where, where can people go to find out more about you is there anything you want to um, say to anybody who's wanting to learn more about truffles and what it is that you do uh, yes, of course. You, I think you mentioned at the beginning, there's my um, uh, my website, which is truffleandmushroomhunter.com. I seem to use Facebook uh, a bit too much, and, and most of my events and things are on there, which is Truffle and Mushroom Hunter on Facebook. Uh, Instagram also, uh, quite a lot of videos and good photographs and not so much things that I'm doing, but things that I have done that you can go and have a little look at visually and, and see what I've been finding and the dogs working and things like that, which are quite interesting. Um, Twitter, I don't use that very much. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm, I'm reachable and of course on email. So info at truffleandmushroomhunter.com. Um, yeah, I'm not hard to get hold of. You can find me in the woods somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's amazing. Um, I just wanted to say massive thank you to you as well. It's been lovely to reconnect and um, also Likewise. just thank you for all of your stories and uh, you know how honest you were and and uh, yeah it's just been you know for anyone who is even remotely interested in this sort of stuff I think this will be a fascinating listen uh, and I really am grateful to you. Um, and as you, you as ever if there's anything, anything that I can do for you in the future then just just let me know. I can be one of those people that you can call up and ask ask about things if you know if my two cents is worth anything but yeah no very grateful and um thank you it's been brilliant thank you very much that's great i've really enjoyed doing it thanks again and, and good to reconnect like you said and uh, yeah you might get that phone call so hopefully <laughs> speak soon <laughs> speak take care soon. ciao bye bye <laughs>